Ladies and gentlemen, it's just on five o'clock and it's time to welcome you to the second in the series of the Shack Online Autumn Talks. And I'll now hand you over to our chairman, Frank James, who can uh, tell us all about it. Okay, thank, thank you, Rob. Uh, just a welcome to the seminar. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping points. Could you all turn on your microphone uh, to mute so we don't have any echoes or any other unfortunate sounds. And secondly, uh, we have a moderated discussion uh, after the talk. Uh, and well, it gives me a very great pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Jennifer Rampling from the History Department at Princeton University. Um, uh, she works on the history of alchemy uh, and she edited Ambix uh, for uh, many years uh, and handed it over uh, in a very good state uh, to, to, to Bruce Moran uh, to carry on uh, the good work. And today she's going to talk with the absolutely wonderful title, Alchemy Behind Bars. Jenny. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Frank, uh, for the introduction. It's wonderful to be here talking to you, Shaq. Um, the talk I'm giving today arises from research that I carried out uh, for my book project, which traces alchemical ideas and practices in England over four centuries. While collecting case studies, I was struck by how many English alchemists spent time in prison, either at home or abroad. And perhaps that shouldn't be surprising, given that alchemy was technically illegal since the early 15th century. Multiplication, or illegally... Um, sort of, um, padding out precious metals uh, was a felony. But what was surprising to me uh, was that these alchemists were seldom imprisoned as a means of, um, you know, as a punishment for alchemical practice. Um, instead, they seemed to use alchemy as a means of supporting themselves while in prison and even of escaping their incarceration entirely. Now, this isn't a complete surprise to historians of science. Uh, in her book, The Jewel House, Deborah Harkness devoted a chapter to the Elizabethan alchemist Clement Draper, who, while a guest of the King's Bench prison in Southwark, collected alchemical texts, exchanged recipes, and carried out alchemical practices. But Draper was clearly not the only alchemist residing at Her Majesty's pleasure. Our story actually begins a little earlier, in the, in the 14th century, when the earliest, the earliest English monarch to have patronised alchemical transmutation seems to have been Edward III, as we learn from the unfortunate career of John of Walden. During the early 1340s, John received 500 gold crowns and 20 pounds of silver from the royal treasury, I quote, to work upon for the benefit of the king by the art of alchemy. Unfortunately, John failed to persuade this vast sum to multiply, and he subsequently landed in the Tower of London for seven and a half years until he was discovered together with several other forgotten prisoners in the course of an audit in 1350 and his testimony was recorded. Now this is a very early and very unusual example of English alchemical patronage. A more typical case is that of John Pigas, a monk of Tewkesbury, who in 1393 was hauled before the Bristol magistrates after he and his confederates set up a counterfeiting operation and, I quote, treasonably made 60 groats from the false metal called alconomy, made in the likeness of good coins, which the alchemists then used to pay for local goods on the high street. Now, rather than alchemical practice, this looks like a clear case of counterfeiting, which was a treasonable offence. But curiously, the king, Richard II, intervened, asking the court to stay execution of any sentence until they received further instructions. Now, probably Pigas had sued for a pardon, and the king might have been sufficiently intrigued by the composition of this mysterious alchemical metal that he was moved to deal graciously with the forger. Now, although these cases are quite fragmentary and we really only know about them from legal records, they do reveal a certain ambiguity towards alchemy. Princes were concerned to prevent fraudulent behaviour, particularly if it threatened to undermine confidence in the coinage. 
but they were also intrigued by the potential of transmutation to resolve pressing economic problems. The possibility that alchemy might not be fraudulent, that it offered a plausible source of cheap bullion, offered a potential escape route for practitioners who were already in trouble for other reasons. Throughout the 15th century, practitioners and would-be practitioners petitioned the king for, for licenses to practice and multiple licenses are recorded for the reigns of Henry VI and his, York, his Yorkist successor, Edward IV, which I'm not going to go into detail about now. I want to instead focus primarily today on the 16th century, a period of territorial expansion and religious reformation that unleashed unprecedented social, economic and confessional change across Europe. And of course, England also shared those problems with the added scourge of a financial crisis under Henry VIII. The king's confiscation of monastic property provided only a short-term boost to the royal coffers after the dissolution of the monasteries. During the 1540s, incompetence in managing the mints and the coinage led to the so-called Great Debasement, when Henry's response to rampant inflation was to devalue English money by reducing the proportion of silver in the alloy. This predictably led to loss of confidence in English coin and a pressing need for precious metal. Now it's at moments like this that we might expect to find transmutational alchemy in high demand. And it's interesting that even before the debasement, men imprisoned on other charges were touting their alchemical skill as a kind of get out of jail card. So in 1532, the Oxford scholar Richard Jones was arrested for his role in a deception involving the nobleman and poet William Neville, who coincidentally uh, was the brother-in-law of Catherine Parr, the future queen. Neville was interested in magic. He had attempted to make a cloak of invisibility and he later sought a ring that would win him royal favour. Jones, who was a diviner, clearly saw him as an easy mark. He prophesied that Neville would succeed to the earldom of Warwick following the death of the king. And incidentally, prophesying the death of the king was never a great idea. Alarmed, Neville's chaplain tipped off Henry VIII's chief minister, Thomas Cromwell. The main actors were arrested and confined to the tower on suspicion of treason. Now Cromwell doesn't seem to have taken the threat very seriously here. In fact, the chief danger to Jones was the potential charge of necromancy or conjuring. But Jones had other skills besides divination. So Neville later deposed that he had seen various books and magical accoutrements in Jones's rooms, in addition to the more conventional stills and alembics of the practicing alchemist. For the historian Geoffrey Elton, who reconstructed the Neville affair using the state papers, there wasn't much to distinguish Jones's magical interests from his alchemy. But for practitioners, transmutation was clearly demarcated from ritual magic, not only by philosoph philosophical and technical content, but also by legal status. While multiplication of metals was a felony, it evidently did not alarm Henry and his ministers to nearly the same extent as necromantic and divinatory practices or the manipulation of political prophecy. Certainly Jones knew the difference when he wrote to Cromwell in an appeal, not just for clemency, but for employment. In a petition that conspicuously makes no reference to magical practice, Jones asks Cromwell to convince the king that he is willing to be bound to the sum of a pound or more to, I quote, make the philosopher's stone. He would furthermore make the stone in 12 and a half months using gold or 12 months with silver. Indeed, Jones says that if Cromwell only shared his confidence, he would regret the time that he had wasted in keeping him incarcerated. For, he says, it is a precious thing. As for the prophesying, Jones implies that this was nothing more than a prank on the gullible Neville, who was already a laughing stock in the country. Now, as our chemical petitions go, this lacks the sophistication of later examples. But even so, it offers glimpses of techniques that are familiar in such petitions. For instance, 
Jones attempts to distinguish himself from fraudulent alchemical practitioners or ignorant men, explaining that the stone is, to many men, doubtful, for they have not the knowledge of the right. To demonstrate his own competence, he cites scripture. Unless the grain of wheat falling into the ground die, itself remaineth alone. Any reader familiar with alchemy would instantly have recognized that allusion to the death of the stone, which has to endure blackening and putrefaction in order to release its vegetative virtue and mature into gold. Now, in the event, Jones's offer of sureties was taken up and he was released later that year, although sadly we don't know if Cromwell ever took advantage of his offered services. The letter is now filed among Cromwell's papers under a laconic heading, Richard Jones would make the philosopher's stone. Now this case hints at two intriguing, if unproven, conclusions. First, it suggests that alchemy as an art was tolerated by the king, to the extent that its practitioners felt able to tout their skill as a means of escaping more serious charges. Second, it opens up the possibility that Jones may actually have been employed on Henry's behalf. Now this leads me to my second example, uh, featuring a much better known practitioner. This is the start of a poem, Bloomfield's Blossoms or the Camp of Philosophy, written in 1557 by the former monk and radical preacher, William Bloomfield. And the poem remains one of the best known products of English alchemy. It's a work that was later included in Elias Ashmole's ubiquitous compendium of English verse, the Theatrum Chemicum Britannicum of 1652, which is illustrated here. But this was not the first alchemical work written by Bloomfield. The earliest evidence we have for his alchemical interests comes from two treatises that he wrote while imprisoned in London's Marshalsea Prison during the 1540s, awaiting trial for the capital crime of conjuring. Like many of his contemporaries, both Catholic and Protestant, Bloomfield had acquired an interest in ritual magic. In fact, his servant, John Morvill, would later depose that Bloomfield planned to use a magical circle that he'd learned about in a book to summon a spirit that would carry him into the air, incidentally destroying part of the building in the process. Bloomfield probably entered prison in April 1543. In October 1545, so about two and a half years later, the Privy Council directed the Knight Marshal, Keeper of the Marshal Sea, to, I quote, deliver one William Bloomfield a prisoner to such one as your majesty shall send for him. But what happened after he came before the council is uncertain. Although Bloomfield was arraigned for conjuring in 1546, he was apparently not convicted and quite possibly never tried. In fact, Bloomfield spent the period of his imprisonment petitioning members of the Privy Council and Henry himself on the basis of his alchemical prowess. These suits have escaped notice owing to the peculiar circumstances of their preservation. Two treatises survive, but both in later copies made by Elizabethan compilers who did not identify them as works of Bloomfield. And I'm showing you here an example uh, from MS Ashmole 1492, now in the Bodleian Library, uh, which is actually transcribed by Christopher Taylor, another well-known alchemical compiler, uh, around about 1604. But when we read these treatises, we discover that the writer was well known to Henry VIII's counsellors, many of whom he managed to offend. His ill wishes include the previous Lord Chancellor, Thomas Audley, the current Lord Chancellor, Thomas Risley, and the inimitable Stephen Gardiner, Bishop of Winchester, who, Bloomfield admits, is grievously angry with him. Although the texts are anonymous, their content, style, and circumstance make it highly probable that both were penned by Bloomfield himself during his documented period of incarceration, uh, possibly as part of a whole sequence of, tra of tracts that he wrote to aid his release. And I'm happy to talk more about uh, my evidence for suspecting Bloomfield's authorship in Q&A, if need be. Now I'm showing you the longer of these two works, which I refer to as the Practic 
which unfolds a remarkable history. The writer claims to have made the Philosopher's Stone 10 years earlier, producing 38 ounces of the marvellous substance on which he lived for five years. He doesn't tell us how he lived on it. Unfortunately, the remainder was confiscated uh, by Thomas Audley's secretary. And since that time, Bloomfield has struggled to replicate the stone, apparently while working under strict and unwelcome supervision by someone he describes as an evil paymaster and overseer. Now he complains bitterly of, I quote, this imprisonment and oppressing with irons, by reason whereof I fear the success to be death or perpetual impotency of my body. He records his charitable desire to share his knowledge of alchemical medicine with the council so that they can appoint some appropriate practitioner to carry out the work. And of course, as you might suspect, the instructions are so obscure and laconic that surely nobody other than Bloomfield himself would ever have hoped to succeed. The second treatise, oh, uh, an incomparable work, supplies further details recording that the writer has been in prison for two and a half years, and he pleads for an opportunity to present his case before the council, desiring you of your goodness at the least to obtain of the King's Majesty and his most honourable council to be called before them to hear me speak, and as they shall think by their discretion to do unto me with mercy, although I have deserved little or none. And Bloomfield was in fact summoned before the Privy Council in October. 1545, exactly two and a half years after his arrest, suggesting that an incomparable work may have been the remnants of a successful petition for audience. If so, he can't have completely succeeded in persuading the councillors of his innocence, since evidence was still being gathered against him nine months later. But whether Bloomfield's lost petitions helped or hindered his cause, they nonetheless tell us a great deal about how alchemical expertise functioned in Henrich in England. So the alchemist offers his audience a trove of valuable knowledge grounded in a philosophical alchemical tradition, which he can make available not only in return for financial patronage, but also in this case for freedom. Bloomfield also includes some interesting illustrations as you see here. One is a wheel which is adapted from influential 14th century alchemical works attributed to the Mallorcan philosopher Ramon Rho. These wheels are very common in 16th century alchemical compendia, so in a sense they show that Bloomfield is at the cutting edge of his science. But perhaps Bloomfield also thought that including it here would help to diffuse otherwise troubling associations between circular figures and necromantic practice. This is particularly telling in light of his servant's testimony, which described his plan to conjure a spirit drawing a circle. In the practic, books and circles are stripped of their magical connotations, which is not to say Bloomfield was innocent of the charge of conjuring, but rather to say that whether or not he actually attempted ritual magic is almost beside the point. The practic offers plausible deniability the possibility that an ignorant servant might simply have mistaken his master's philosophical exercises for evidence of sorcery, or imputed a necromantic meaning to a strange book embellished with wheels and astronomical symbols. By his own admission in the text, Bloomfield has used circles to conjure spirits, but his circles are simply Lullian wheels, and his spirits are the pure essences drawn out of wine and metallic bodies. Unfortunately, we don't know whether Bloomfield was ever taken up on his offer to resume alchemical practice for this state. We do know that decades later, he was still alive and writing to the sovereign, this time addressing a collection of alchemical remedies to Queen Elizabeth I, while still complaining about bad treatment, this time at the hands of enemies in his parish. It's the reign of Elizabeth that offers the most evidence for alchemical activity in English prisons. The 1560s and 70s witnessed what Glyn Parry has called an alchemy craze. The Queen and several of her ministers were known for their interest in alchemy. They even went so far as to fund the expensive practice of a Dutch alchemist, Cornelius de Lannoy, who promised transmutation. 
the fate of Dinanoi is in fact an unusually clear-cut case of punishment for failure to succeed in alchemy. Uh, his sponsors, including the Queen, grew impatient with lengthy delays and constant excuses. And most of all, by Dinanoi's plans to flee England with another patron, Princess Cecilia of Sweden. So Delanoy and his practice ended up being relocated to the Tower of London, where the alchemist seems to have remained, even after his sponsors gave up uh, hope. But other English alchemists found themselves on the wrong side of the bars for other reasons, most often the debt. Now the 13 year imprisonment of Clement Draper, a merchant, is well documented. The antiquarian and Chaucer scholar Francis Thin also spent time during the 1570s imprisoned for debt at the White Lion Prison in London. And during that time, he composed this beautiful compendium of alchemical treatises, which he illustrated himself. And he also petitioned his patron, William Cecil, Lord Burley. Thin had previously composed a lengthy alchemical poem for Cecil, again lavishly illustrated which appealed to the minister's well-known interest in both transmutation and alchemical medicine, while also showing off Thin's interest in heraldry. And Cecil may have exerted himself since Thin was actually released. Much later, in 1603, Thin did succeed in obtaining advancement, not as an alchemist, but as a herald. Now, not all alchemists have such lavish aspirations or the advantage of such patronage in high places. In a manuscript in the Bodleian Library, we find the brief account of an alchemist and his wife at work in the Wood Street Counter, a small prison that opened in 1555, usually for debtors and for minor dis misdemeanors such as drunkenness. And this alchemist's name is Mr. Cassie, and he is, the text tells us, a prisoner in the counter in Wood Street who doth make perfect silver at all trials and man maintaineth himself and his wife and they both work together in this work, and his gains weekly is 20 shillings a week and more. His stock is 20 shillings, and this he and his wife being aged. And this he doth weekly, and it is very laborious. So alchemy might offer a pastime or an opportunity to impress patrons, but potentially it also offered a much needed source of income for poor and elderly prisoners. And sadly, I don't know more at this time uh, about this figure. Now, for my final case study, we will actually leave England entirely, uh, but we'll do so accompanied by perhaps the most notorious alchemist of the age, Edward Kelly. Now, Kelly is still best known in scholarly literature as a squire to the prominent mathematician, astrologer, alchemist and bibliophile John Dee, most of all for his role in mediating Dee's uh, famous conversations with angels, which has led to him being studied primarily as an appendage of D, rather than as a practitioner in his own right. But Kelly surely deserves study on his own merit, not the least as an accomplished client who consistently impressed prospective patrons with his abilities, whether in alchemy or angel magic. He was certainly more successful than D in alchemical matters, the two men and their households arrived in Imperial Prague in 1586, seeking fortune and patronage. The Holy Roman Emperor, Rudolf II, uh, offered Kelly the patronage he desired, eventually validating his claims of noble Irish descent and presenting him with both an imperial knighthood and a seat on the Privy Council. In April 1591, it all went wrong. Questions over his alchemical prowess prompted Kelly's flight from Prague in an, in an attempt to gain sanctuary with his primary patron at Wilhelm Rosenberg, one of the great uh, magnates of Bohemia. Overtaken en route, he was incarcerated uh, at the emperor's pleasure in the fortress of Kriklovats or Perglitz, is the fortress. And his arrest caused something of a sensation, partly because nobody was entirely sure why it happened. Some thought that uh, he was in debt, that he had slandered the emperor or even attempted to poison him. Others thought that Rudolf had learned of attempts by Queen Elizabeth to lure Kelly away from Prague and had imprisoned the gold maker to keep him from absconding. So it's interesting that his imprisonment isn't directly related to failure in alchemy, although that may have been um, a factor. 
Now this story up to this point is extremely well known, but what is not well known is what happened to Kelly next during his time in Perglitz. Did he stay in the small cramped cell that witnesses described as his initial residence? And why did the emperor relent a few years later and release him? Well, as an alchemical reader and writer, Kelly's activities have been largely overshadowed by those of Dee, but actually Kelly did write. In fact, he wrote a lot and he wrote many of those treatises while imprisoned. And I think the reason for the neglect is that they survive primarily in manuscript, particularly in one manuscript, a codex from the library of Rudolf II, now held in Leipzig University Library. And this is MS Leipzig uh, 0398. Uh, and I should just mention that um, although the book hasn't really been studied, uh, I was put onto it uh, by a tip um, from Raphael Prinker, who's worked on Dean Kelly for years, uh, who years ago during my PhD sent me um, a catalogue entry because Kelly talks about uh, George Ripley, the subject of my own graduate research uh, in these treatises. Now, these, this, this manuscript preserves a series of philosophical and practical tracts prepared by Kelly for the emperor during the period of his incarceration. And the writings offer us a new view of Edward Kelly, not as a one-dimensional charlatan, nor as a secondary player in the story of John Dee, but as a sophisticated alchemical reader and exegete, whose success rested at least in part on his skill at translating text-based descriptions into replicable effects. Kelly's practice was able to breathe life into medieval texts, like the writings of his English authority, George Ripley, who flourished in the 1470s. So formerly in the library of Rudolf II, this manuscript comprises more than 400 folios of alchemical contents in Latin and German. It's not written in Kelly's hand. Most of it's written in a clear formal secretary hand and a few entries have been added later, including one in, uh, dated 1600. So that's after Kelly's death. So it looks as though this is actually a later attempt to compile the Englishman's prison writings, which had then been supplemented by the compiler's own attempted expositions. Now, Kelly had lost the support of his most powerful protector when Willem Rosenberg died on the 31st of August, 1592. But that loss coincided with a seeming olive branch from the imperial household when one of Rudolf's chamber servants, Hannes Hayden, wrote to the Castellan of, per of Perglitz, Jan Jindrich Prohofer of Pergersdorf, seeking the Castellan's assistance in extracting alchemical secrets from Kelly, including his process for potable gold. By recruiting the Castellan as an intermediary, he also opened a channel of communication with the English alchemist. And this seems to be the moment when Kelly takes his destiny back into his own hands. He responded less than a month later with an alchemical treatise in 16 folios. Now I'll just show you some of the content of the manuscript. So there's a wonderful series of these, these Donum Dei images. Uh, and there are also treatises like this one. And you can see the heading is Edward Kelly composed this book in prison at Perglitz in the year 1592, uh, March the, the 1st in Bohemia. It's primarily a philosophical treatise. For instance, Kelly uses the language of Aristotelian natural philosophy to explain alchemical change and to tease the identity of his mysterious prime matter. A few months later, in the 14th, as he says, in the 14th month of his misfortune in prison at Perglitz, which is to say June 1592, he submitted a much longer treatise, uh, De Chimicis Oratio, or An Oration on Chemists, which is an extravagant piece of rhetoric embellished with phrases from classical poets. And the aim of this treatise, tellingly, is to distinguish true philosophers from frauds. It's followed by a series of elaborate tables prefaced by a separate letter to, Emperor, to the Emperor Rudolf. Kelly's tone swings between arrogance and despair, although he never compromises on the subject of his own innocence. So he concludes the Aratio's prefatory letter with a passionate appeal to Rudolf, I quote, on bended knees and with all submission, 
that your majesty might at last have pity on me, the most innocent of men and well-deserving. In the introduction to the tables, he condemns the enemies who have falsely accused him and urges the emperor to, I quote, desist from destroying a most innocent man with such bitter anger. The preface ends on a heartrending note from Kelly, the most afflicted of mortals. But just a few lines earlier, we find him bargaining, not too subtly, for better treatment. So he tells the emperor he can't yet provide the tables for gold and silver, the most crucial part of the process, since he lacks adequate writing materials. He says, I quote, if more paper had been available, I would have completed the remaining golden tables of Sol and Luna, and if at any time the grace of your majesty will smile upon me with favour, I will make you the master of this wonderful science. Finally, I will repeat this again, have mercy on me, Caesar, according to your great mercy. On me, I say, the most innocent of men and your servant. Now, perhaps the most remarkable feature of this campaign is its apparent success. Unlike many disgraced practitioners of the, six, of the, practitioners of the 16th century, like the alchemists who uh, Tari Numadol has worked on, for instance, uh, in the German lands, Kelly actually was released from prison. He obtained his freedom in the autumn of 1593, and although he never regained his former level of intimacy with the emperor, he was able to return to his estates and resume the life of a gentleman. Because as Kelly well knew, it was not enough to just claim his innocence. He had to show that his practical expertise still mattered. And as we move through his prison writings, it becomes clear that he was not just sitting idly in his cell. He was actually able to resume his practice, now under the supervision of his jailer, Prolhofer. In fact, echoes of Prolhofer's reports live on in Leipzig 0398 in the form of unattributed fragments which refer to Kelly in the third person. So, for instance, one account relates to the Englishman's famous process for the mercury of gold, Mercurius Solis, a process that's titled Kelly worked the impregnation of common mercury with Mercurius Solis in such a way. The writer reports that Kelly first sublimed and congealed his solar mercury with a calcined oil, before grinding it to powder with common quicksilver. In the space of a single night, the combined mercury sublimed together into the top of the vessel. The sublimate was then gathered by Kelly, who reserved part of it for his own further work in, in the practice, but giving the remainder to the writer, I quote, to be sent back to his most sacred majesty in Prague. Now, Kelly's good fortune was not long lived. Uh, only a couple of years after his release, he was imprisoned again, this time in the fortress of Most. And records of his final days are blurry. For instance, uh, he may have taken poison after a failed escape, as one contemporary account suggests. But his writing survived, offering a new portrait of Edward Kelly as more than just an appendage to his collaborator D, but as an alchemist in his own right and one who seems to have continued a lively practice and writing career, even while imprisoned. As I looked through these case studies, I was struck by some of the connections between them. The way in which imprisoned alchemists, regardless of the reason for their imprisonment, were able to manipulate their skill in order to request patronage or to seek other forms of better treatment. There were clear connections between the rhetoric used by William Bloomfield in the 1540s and Edward Kelly in the 1590s. For example, offering practices that clearly only the writer is clearly going to be able to pursue to completion. And the drawing on late medieval sources, both as a source of practical knowledge and as a kind of authority, a genealogy of practice in which the writer now carefully positions himself in order to bolster claims of innocence as well as competence. Alchemy remained legally a double-edged sword, an object of suspicion through its dangerous connections with counterfeiting and natural magic. But also, as we have seen, it offered imprisoned practitioners a potential source of benefit, whether as grounds for a license to practice or even as an opportunity to get out of jail free. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Jenny. That was super. Um, I think one of the problems with Zoom is you can't really can't really clap. But, um, I, I, I saw everybody, everybody. Oh yes, you can see you can see people clapping. Okay. Um, uh, I'll I'll use my use my um, usual chairs prerogative and ask the first question. Um, you've talked about you've talked about England. You've talked about some of the sort of German speaking lands. Um, I was just sort of wondering. What is it, whether if you sort of looked at Italy or France, you find similar um, stories, similar case studies, um, and I'm just wondering how many people are we actually talking about? I mean, you've got, you've got three three case studies here. Uh, are there many other studies that you can sort of find lurking in the sort of state papers, legal records, and, and so on? Um, thank you. Um... So yes, uh, I mean, it, there are clearly grounds here for a much broader study. Um, so the research I presented today was partly a byproduct of, of the original plan for the book, which was going to trace uh, alchemical practices and philosophies in England over a four century period. Um, and, you know, I think if I were to expand beyond England, I'd find a lot more. Now, Tara Numadal uh, has really done a huge amount of work uh, on the German lands. So her book, Alchemy and Authority in the Holy Roman Empire, um, sort of gives us the story of practitioners who approached princes for patronage, didn't work, you know, the, the practice failed, they ended up in prison and very often they ended up uh, being executed. And I think what really struck me about these English cases is that they don't seem to follow the same pattern as those German cases, in that I haven't found a single example of an English alchemist being executed. Um, in fact, I haven't really found cases of alchemists being left to languish in prison either, the only one that applies to is Cornelius de Lannoy, and he's Dutch, he, uh, educated in, in Krakow, but, uh, but Dutch. Um, and, and that's the only one that really seems to follow the kind of German princely model. Um, so I think there's probably a lot that could be done here comparatively. Um, now, I do know that there's, a, there's at least a, a couple of cases in France around the same time, um, although I haven't worked on these myself. Um, this is a recent book, and the author's name is escaping me, but I'll pop it in the chat maybe. Um, uh, when it comes back to me, um, which, which suggests that French alchemists sometimes used alchemical claims as a way of diverting attention from possible counterfeiting of currency. Um, in England, successive monarchs just seem to have been really interested in the, uh, in the potential of alchemy and therefore don't seem to have enforced the statute against multiplication particularly harshly. Now, I wish I had dozens and dozens of extra examples. There actually are some further examples, um, uh, which I didn't mention. So for instance, in 1551, um, a prophesier called Robert Allen was held in the Tower of London, and he, like Bloomfield, tried to get an audience with the Privy Council, because he said, and I've actually got the quotation right here, he said that he could say more concerning astrology and astronomy than all the learned men within the universities of Oxford and Cambridge, and he also said that he had the secret of the great elixir. And all of that suggests that he's trying to throw as much pasta at the wall as he can to see what sticks. Um, I don't know what happened to him, unfortunately. Um, but there were, there were certainly, you know, once you get to a dozen cases from rather fragmentary sources, I think it's not too speculative to say there's a trend here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. So just to remind everybody, if you could sort of send your questions to uh, Anna Simmons on, on the, um, uh, uh, chat function. Now I've got a question here from Daniel Garber who says a number of alchemists were imprisoned as debtors. Is there anything special to distinguish them from other debtors over and above the fact that they were alchemists? Thank you very much uh, Dan. Um, yeah it's so in the case of some like um, uh, Robert Records and Clement Draper and I guess, but, well certainly those two, I don't think there's any evidence that would distinguish them from other alchemists, so sorry, from other debtors. Um, it's merely that they seem to, that they happen to have pursued alchemical interests while in prison. Um, the case of Francis Thin is more ambiguous because it's possible that his debts arose from the expense of alchemical practice. Um, honestly, the evidence doesn't really give us an answer one way or the other. So the sort of received story is that he fell into debt because of his expensive alchemical practice. But reading Thin, I'm not convinced that he actually practiced that much. He seems to have been mainly interested in sort of literary and scholarly dimensions of alchemy. Uh, 
So, I mean, he, he was undoubtedly massively in debt. I mean, he married an heiress and then basically wasted her fortune. Um, but um, what really seems to distinguish these practitioners isn't their reason for being in prison in the first place. It's the way that they try to use their alchemical knowledge to either make their conditions of incarceration more palatable or to actually escape them altogether, which I find fascinating. Okay, thank you. Um, Daniel, if you want to sort of respond, could you sort of send a message to, to Becky Martin? And while you're doing that, uh, the second question I've got is from Hassan Chang. Um, what were the key differences between how alchemy and magic were treated legally? And how do you explain those differences? Thank you. Um, thanks, Hassel. So, to a, I think to a large extent, the treatment of both depends on what individual princes think of either. So Henry VIII was clearly very nervous about, uh, about magic. So he passes the witchcraft statute in, in 1541 that actually you know, makes it... Uh, um, a felony. It, it was already, you know, it was already uh, illegal, but this, you know, this really sets it down um, in quite in quite strong terms. And so Bloomfield seems to have fallen foul of that statute with his conjuring practices, which may be why he's why he's in prison. Um, so multiplication is a felony. It's a, it's a 1403 felony. So under you know, under Henry IV, um, that means that if you're multiplying, uh, you can lose life and goods. So it's, it's a serious offence on paper. What seems to be distinctive about it is that it's not being, um, doesn't seem to be followed up so harshly in practice. So there is a case in 1415 where this alchemist from Newcastle on Tyne ends up doing alchemy in an Essex monastery, collaborating with the prior. Um, and then they go and pitch their work to the Countess of Hereford, who's actually the, the king's grandmother which suggests that they weren't being too secret about it. I mean, if they were worried about their necks, they presumably wouldn't have done that. And in fact, they do end up indicted, um, but they're pardoned. In fact, the alchemist is pardoned. The prior isn't, you know, his, his um, involvement isn't even deemed sufficient for punishment. Um, so while they're both, well, while they're both technically um, bad things to do, in actual fact, magic does seem to have been treated more seriously. And even in the 15th century, there's one license issued by Henry VI that basically tells the alchemist, this guy called John Misseldon, that the alchemy is fine as long as he does not use any practice of necromancy, but only the plain science of philosophy. That's what he says, the plain science of philosophy. So I think maybe that's the crux here. If you're doing the plain science of philosophy, that's okay. But if you are invoking spirits and not the alchemical kind of spirit but actual angels and demons that's where you are conjuring um, and that's what um, that's what seems to really trigger uh, punishment okay thank you um again has to want to come back is to send a message to uh, to becky um so the next question is from zoe stretty who i hope i pronounced that correctly uh, she says, thank you for your excellent paper. She really enjoyed it. Uh, part of one of my thesis chapters concerns the practice of alchemy in prison. And I wonder if you have, if you have anything to say about the relationship between imprisoned alchemists and their jailers in England. Have you come across any accounts from jailers, such as the one in the case of Kelly in England? Oh, I wish, I really wish I had. Uh, so the simple answer is no. Um, and honestly, even the relationship with Prohoffer, I have had to really um, infer that from some pretty tangential references in Kelly's own writings. So he never actually addresses the Castellan by name, for instance, although he does write this treatise that I think is clearly for Prohoffer because it begins by addressing him like, oh, most excellent captain. And I think he's sucking up to his jailer. Um, but uh, I know absolutely nothing about the English cases. But I have to just add, I haven't looked. So the evidence that I've presented today, I've really come across by looking primarily at alchemical treatises, and they have sometimes set me on the, you know, the sort of breadcrumb trail to go and look at state papers and legal records that pertain to those figures. I haven't gone and looked at who particular jailers were in particular prisons, and I think that would be a fascinating line of inquiry. And I'm very happy to hear that you're working along similar lines too, because this is clearly a, an interesting 
you know, an interesting line of research. Perhaps I could sort of just follow up on, on that. Um, throughout your, your talk, you mentioned all sorts of sources, state papers, legal papers, those kind of documents, which are not, nor, not the sort of normal stomping ground for sort of historians of, um, of, of science. And I just wonder um, if you could sort of comment about whether there's sort of any sort of difference in the skill sets you need to deploy in order to sort of get to grips with this material and how you found it in the first place because our legal documents sort of index or catalog with sort of words that contains of chemical material do you just have to sort of uh, wade through huge quantities of material to find what you're looking for um yeah so so I mean, this is a great methodological question uh, basically once something is in the state papers you're home dry because they've been so exhaustively uh, examined over the years although i have a cautionary tale about that which i'll tell in a moment so I started by just going through the state papers, looking for references to alchemy. Um, and it helps that um, Dorothy Singer, who, you know, back in the, the, the 1930s, produced this fantastic bibliography of alchemical manuscripts in English libraries. Um, she included um, sections from uh, legal documents that she, she uncovered in her researches in that, in that uh, catalogue. Um, so I often use Singer as a starting point, and then I'd go to the National Archives and basically call up the, the documents that Singer uh, catalogued so that I could read them um, in their complete form. Um, so the 14th century examples, for instance, that I gave today um, uh, have, have Singer as their starting point. So if you, have, if you have resources like that, where there's already been a bit of scholarship done, that's enormously helpful. Um, my, my great love, personally, is our chemical manuscripts, as some of you know. So I always start in the archive reading the works of the, of the alchemists themselves. And then once you have names, you can start digging around a little bit um, uh, in legal and administrative documents to see if the name comes up anywhere. Um, I mean, if it's someone like Francis Thin, there's already a bit of scholarship on him. Um, there have been a couple of articles. He has an ODMB entry, for instance. Um, so finding information on Thin is much easier than finding information on, say, William Bloomfield. Uh, although um, Robert Schuller, who edited Bloomfield's Blossoms, has actually done some, some great work. And he was the one who first discovered uh, that Bloomfield was in the Marshalsea prison. Um, although I don't think anybody's noticed the two treatises I mentioned today because they don't have Bloomfield's name on them. Um, so that's, that's where the real problem arises. It's when you have a treatise that isn't attributed but the time and the circumstances seem highly suggestive. So that's when you really start cross-referencing the treatises against the, the legal and, and, and other records. Um, the caution we I wanted to mention is that in my first draft of the book, I was incredibly excited to find a license to an alchemist issued by Henry VIII, um, which I have revised in the final version of the book. It's, I no longer think it's a license of Henry VIII. I think it's a license of Henry VI. And the reason I thought it was a license of Henry VIII was that the editors of the state papers um, included it as such, including a misleading quotation of the, of the manuscript um, that, that, ha that said Henry VIII in it. But when I went and looked at the original manuscript, it didn't say Henry VIII, it just said Henry. And for other reasons which I won't bore you with, um, when I followed up it became clear that this could only be a license issued by Henry VI. So I mean it was it was all finding a previously unknown 15th century license, it was less awesome realising that the only license issued under Henry VIII actually wasn't. Never mind, these, these things happen I'm afraid to say. Uh, so I've got a question from uh, Spencer Greenrich. Um, Greenrich, yeah. He says, given, <laughs> my apologies, uh, he says, given the fraught disputes over the Eucharist at this period in England and elsewhere, is there any linking of alchemists to the confessional conflicts of the day? It's uh, a great question. Um, and I think, yes, there is, but I'm not sure if that their confessional involvement is sort of because of the alchemy. I mean, I'm not sure that they're necessarily connected. Um, a lot of people were, you know, had obviously clear um, religious commitments during this period, and some of them also happened to be alchemists. So. Um, Bloom, I'm going to go back to Bloomfield again as the obvious example because Bloomfield is a rare example of an alchemist who's pretty outspoken about his religious uh, views, perhaps sufficiently outspoken that 
he did get into trouble. So the first time that Bloomfield turns up um, in the records is during the 1520s when he actually has to recount for heresy. So he, the guy's a Benedictine monk at this point, uh, and he seems to have been interested in Lutheranism. Uh, this is something that Robert Schuller turned up. Um, so no alchemical content there, but then he, he later ends up in trouble for conjuring, uses his alchemy, and then when he eventually writes the treatise for Elizabeth I, his preface to that treatise is loaded with religious language. Um, he, I mean, he, he seems to have viewed himself as being in some sense tasked by God um, to, to preach on earth, and he sees alchemy as part of that mission. Uh, so, um, and, and, and in Bloomfield's Blossoms too, uh, he, actually said, he actually says pretty clearly that uh, to have true knowledge of alchemy, you need to be one of the elect. So even then in the 1550s, he's embracing apparently Calvinist doctrines in his alchemical work. Um, it's not all, the connection isn't always that obvious. Um, and I don't have any, I don't have any case where I can say this alchemist was in prison for religious convictions and there's a link with the practice. It'd be really great if I could find that, or if anybody else does. Okay. Uh, Stephen Kukas is next. Um, Francis then clearly put his heraldic, heraldic skills to good use in his alchemical manuscripts. And uh, he wants to know whether are there any other examples of interactions between heraldry and alchemy in the English context? Thank you, Stephen. Why, yes, there is. Um, so, uh, as some of you know, I work on a group of alchemical manuscripts called the Ripley Scrolls. And um, until recently, uh, they were all in public libraries, with the exception of one that was still held in private hands. And in December 2017, Princeton University bought the last one in private hands, so now it's in a library as well. Um, and I'm hoping really soon we'll be able to put it on display. So we were supposed to have an exhibition at Princeton this spring, which was deferred to next spring. And I think it's likely to be, to be deferred another year to 2022 because the pandemic shows no real sign of uh, ceasing to be a problem. Um, the point about this Ripley scroll is that it was made, as far as we can tell, by a herald, a guy called Leonard Smethley. So of the 23 Ripley scrolls, this is the only one that's signed by its creator. So Leonard Smethley signed his name and dated it 1624 at the bottom of the roll. And there was a Leonard Smethley based in Manchester at that, um, at that time, um, who was a herald. Um, and also the way that the thing's painted, the kind of colours used, do seem, it, they are certainly compatible uh, with heraldic art of the period. So yes, I am trying to cobble together um, some sort of thesis that there's a link between alchemy and heraldry. Uh, particularly because Elias Ashmole, you know, writing much later in the, the 1650s, of course, um, uh, was also obsessed with heraldic matters and constantly pursued the goal of being appointed um, uh, historian of the, um, the Knights of the Garter uh, and collected heraldic documents. So it makes sense, doesn't it? You know, heraldry and alchemy are both concerned with allegorical representations, terrible puns, bright colours. I mean, you, you, can, you can make a case there. And I, I think it's something I'll probably be expanding on in the next book project, which is on alchemical imagery. But I didn't have time to pursue it further uh, in the current one. Okay, next question is from Alexander Stoger. Uh, first of all, comment. He thank, thanks you for insight into interesting case studies. And his question is, um, did rulers or patrons from different denominations regard alchemy differently, especially from a legal point of view? From different denominations, so we're talking Protestant or Catholic? Yeah. Or, yes. So we're still within, within, within Christianity. Um, so, I mean, yeah, practically all patrons view it differently. You have as many views as you have patrons and as many views as you have practitioners. But if those differences were due to confessional reasons, that's not clear to me. Um, partly, I mean, you know, we shouldn't forget that Luther himself was rather supportive of alchemy. He actually speaks quite approvingly um, of it uh, in his table talk because he thinks that that kind of allegorical messaging can also be used to speak of weighty matter, religious matters too. Um, so I think there's nothing sort of 
I mean, when we're talking about alchemy, we're, we're talking about a set of practices that have very obvious material benefits. And those benefits can be framed in ways that appeal more to, say, a Catholic sensibility or a Calvinist sensibility, but they can be tweaked to appeal to anything. So, for instance, you know, John of Rupert Sisso writing in the 1350s, he talks, you know, he's writing for an audience of Franciscans, evangelical men, as he says, and who've embraced a vow of poverty. And so he's offering them alchemical remedies, which are very cheap to make, which you make by distilling wine. Um, so, you know, clearly that, that kind of rhetoric sits within a, you know, a medieval Catholic um, sensibility. Uh, William Bloomfield is happy using, uh, you know, the language of, of election. Um, at least off the top of my head, I cannot think of any examples of princes being swayed towards alchemy by specifically confessional matters. Um, I'm happy to be, I'm happy to be corrected or, or better informed on that point. Okay, thank you. And I, th and question from Joe Hedison, uh, which I think should be our last, last question. Um, there are many presumably pseudo Kelly manuscripts surviving in different collections. Are there some specific internal traits or characteristics that distinguish the authentic Kelly treatises and can they and can be used to separate them from false ones? Thanks, Joe. Great question. Uh, that's that's definitely a next project. So I, I, I realise that it's, it's now my kind of sacred duty to edit some of these these texts because everybody loves Edward Kelly. Um, but the interesting thing is that I think a lot of what's printed, it probably is pseudonymous. Um, so there isn't a lot printed, um, but there's a treatise called the, uh, what is it, the Theatre of Terrestrial Astronomy. I don't see any good evidence for that being by Kelly. I think it's, it, it's become associated with Kelly because it was bundled with a couple of Kelly works in print. Um, but there's nothing about that that seems at all Kellyan to me, which tells me that I am, you know, I am making judgments about what is and isn't Kellyan. So what I notice in the prison tracts is the following. Um, he's really into what I call Saraconian alchemy, which is the style of alchemy that George Ripley pushes um, in his writings in the 1470s, um, and which is based on the idea that the prime matter of the work is drawn from a base metal, variously interpreted as copper, lead, antimony, or even other things like tartar of wine. Um, which has to be dissolved in a sour vinegary solvent, uh, possibly distilled vinegar. So Kelly's right behind that, and most of his treatises allude to that particular approach. He even calls it Sericon, but he uses other uh, cover names as well. He talks about fraud a lot, probably because, being a very smart guy, he knows that he's constantly under suspicion of it, and so he uses various rhetorical te techniques to distinguish his work from that of these supposed frauds. Um, he talks a lot about the transformation of elements into one another. So if we were looking for a sort of Kelly and matter theory, we'd probably be a bit disappointed. There's nothing in, you know, really exciting and innovative here. There's nothing like, you know, a corpuscular matter theory. He's sort of recycling pretty standard Aristotelian tropes. And my, and my sense from his writings is that this is someone who really, he's really good at practice and he's really good at getting patronage and he knows how to make just the right noises to um, get patrons to open their, their purses. But he's not really interested in innovating in theory. Maybe he leaves that to John Dee because John Dee was great at coming up with elaborate theories, but not particularly successful at getting patrons to open their purses, probably because He's hitting them with all of, you know, I mean, if you read the Monus Hieroglyphica, you know exactly what I mean. This is a fascinating book, but it's not the book that says, and you will have, you know, 200% profit by the end of next year, Your Highness. Uh, whereas Kelly's do gesture more in that direction. Okay, well, th th thank you, Jenny. It just now remains for me to say that the uh, next uh, seminar in the series will be on the 3rd of November. Please ignore the 5th of November on the original um, uh, um, slide at the beginning. Uh, we're um, at starting at 5 p.m. GMT because we're about to go into, into winter time. Um, and it's by Caroline Cobbold, uh, who's going to be talking about a rainbow palette, chemist's colour and consumption. And it's entirely coincidental that she'll have a book out more or less of that title um, by then. Uh, I need to thank uh, everybody who
uh, participated in um, producing this um, uh, Zoom cast, that's the word I can use, that's uh, Rob Johnson, Anna Simons, Caroline Cobold and uh, Becky Martin. And finally, uh, thank Jenny for providing a really excellent, interesting uh, seminar, um, which I certainly learned a lot from. So thank you, Jenny, and I think it's all virtual clapping again. And thank you very much, all of you. Great questions too. Okay, well, good. have a good evening or morning or um, night, depending on where you happen to, happen to be. So thank you, Jenny. Au revoir.